of our solid waste from, sorry, had a little pop-up. Um, if we could eliminate the waste that comes from our food and drink, uh, especially the waste that's inappropriately discarded into the environment, you can see that this top 10 list would um, be dramatically different. Now here's the same list, but this time what I highlighted uh, in yellow are things that are plastic. Cigarette filters are indeed plastic, those, those little fibers or cellulose acetate. And you see most of the rest of the list is either in yellow or orange. Orange are things that are mostly plastic, like toys, cigarette lighters, um, rope. Most of the rope we find during these cleanups is nylon. So we've got a problem with plastic. So what are the impacts? It's really well known uh, and well documented the physical impacts of our debris on wild animals. There's also chemical impacts of chemicals that transfer from the plastic um, to the animals that eat it. Ingestion of our plastic waste is, is also well documented. Uh, the bottom left is a Kemp's Ridley sea turtle, highly endangered. That was found on an island in Virginia, Fisherman Island, with two balloons in its esophagus and uh, plastic ribbons coming out of its mouth. Also well documented are the impacts of entanglement, animals that get entangled in our debris. So what are the most harmful things? If we could stop any of this debris from entering the ocean, what would be the priorities? Uh, this study that was done a few years ago found that fishing gear, not surprisingly, is the most dangerous, most harmful uh, nets and um, fishing line and crab pots, things like that. But you see the rest of that list all comes from, we eat and drink for, uh, other than cigarette butts. So these are highly dangerous things in the environment. They're, in da they're dangerous to human health um, as well as marine life. This is a Daphnia, a water flea, and those little specks of green are microplastics, tiny, tiny pieces of plastics that that animal has ingested. There's also impacts on habitat and economies. Um, you know, a lot of communities spend a lot of money removing debris, especially beach communities, because they want the tourists to come. So there's lots of costs to this debris. So, that's just a real brief look at some of the sources and some of the impacts. And now I wanna talk about solutions. Um, I wanna stress that there are so many people and governments and companies and nonprofits that are working on solutions to this issue. And I believe that most of the approaches to dealing with this environmental issue, as well as many environmental issues, fall into these three buckets, education, innovation, legislation. And by education, I mean that very broadly to include behavior change, not just educating people about the harm that their mismanaged solid waste, their litter can cause, but having them internalize that and make a commitment to changing their behavior. Like I will not release balloons into the air because I know that is littering. I will not litter my cigarette butt because that is incorrect. So education, I mean that very broadly. Innovation, uh, all kinds of ways that we can change the way we do what we're doing uh, to create less waste in the first place. And then legislation, when innovation and education is not enough, then laws, often are very, very effective at changing behavior. Uh, I wanted to share this image with you of some of the things I'm talking about when we talk about innovation. Right now we have, as you see on the left, pretty much a linear economy. We make things, we use things, we dispose of them, mostly to landfills. A recycling economy takes those products that we produce and use and recycles them so they're used, the material is used several times before it ends up going ultimately to the landfill. The circular economy, which I'm sure is a concept many of you are familiar with, there is no waste. 
uh, things are made to be reused over and over and over. And a lot of the changes that we need to go from this linear to the circular economy um, will happen with innovation. One of the um, parts of the solutions that we have in place in Virginia is the uh, Virginia Marine Debris Reduction Plan. And I sometimes wish that we had called this the Marine Debris and Plastic Pollution and Litter Reduction Plan because it's all related. Uh, as we said, so much of the debris in our ocean comes from inland, comes from people who, who litter. So um, this Virginia Marine Debris Reduction Plan was written in 2014 and it's being renovated and updated right now. And I'll talk a little bit about that in just a second. But we were really proud Virginia was the first state on the East Coast. In fact, we were only the second state to have a Marine Debris Act and Plan. And after uh, us, after Virginia, many states have adopted their own plans to deal with this, this major problem. So here's um, the Virginia uh, Marine Debris Reduction Plan for 2021 through 2025. It's uh, been drafted with lots of input from dozens and if not hundreds of, of people and stakeholders. It's right now open for comments and I'll share the link with your um, leaders uh, so they can send it out to you if you're interested in commenting or reading the, uh, the draft plan. We're also looking for organizations to sign on as partners. There's lots of actions um, and we're looking for groups who say, yes, we want to work on this project and we will sign up as a partner, which means you'll be part of the dialogue as we work over the next five years. So the four major groups that are uh, goals that we have in this plan, first, single-use plastics, which uh, a lot of us shorten that to the word SUP. Um, so single-use plastics, consumer debris is the biggest um, part of this reduction plan. The other three categories are fishing gear, that becomes derelict, microplastics and microfibers, and then lastly, abandoned and derelict vessels. Um, in the past, we've had three marine debris summits, and we've got another one coming up next year. So I, I hope that you'll all mark that on your calendar. My last slide tells you a little bit more about that. Uh, but these summits have been great. They've brought together all kinds of people to share research and to share resources and talk about what they're doing in their community. Um, they've been really, really ins inspirational. So one of the things that came out of the original Virginia Marine Debris Reduction Plan was the understanding that social marketing campaigns are effective at changing behavior. And when I say social marketing, I do not mean social media, which is you know like Twitter and Facebook, that's social media. But social marketing is, um, I don't know if you'd call it a science, but it's a practice where you listen carefully to the persons who are doing the behavior that you want to change and you talk to them about what would make them change their behavior. Um, a lot of social marketing campaigns have been built around healthcare. Like how do you get people to brush their teeth, do things that are good for them and good for you know, society. Um, but social marketing campaigns for the environment are really taking off so we crafted one looking at uh, people who choose to release balloons. You know, they go to the store, they buy hundreds of helium filled balloons and mostly with plastic ribbons and then they go outside and release them. So we um, did this extensive campaign. We brought together people who release balloons. We, we asked them, you know, what other thing could you do that would make you feel the same way? Um, so I wanted to uh, ask you a few pop quizzes. You just have to answer this quiet, see how you do. So first question, what do you think is the number one event during which people release balloons? Are they store openings, sporting events, weddings, memorial events, or fundraising events? So which do you think? Well, the correct answer is actually memorial events. This graph here shows we did one full year of looking at 
um, media reports, newspapers and televisions that talked about balloon releases. And we found that blue segment there um, are releases that were planned around either funerals or memorial events or, you know, like, oh, it's been one year since we lost grandpa, you know, things like that. So another pop quiz, this one really was interesting. According to our research, what percentage of balloon releases do you think are organized by women? You think it's about 28, 39, 65, 83% or 100? Well, the answer from our research is 83% of balloon releases that we learned about were organized by women. So that was my opener, but that helped us craft our campaign to be targeting mostly women. And one of the first things we came up with was this website. And we, I mean, um, this was a collaborative project funded by the Virginia Coastal Zone Management Program. Uh, the Coastal Zone Management Program in Virginia has really taken a leadership role in bringing together partners to talk about preventing marine debris. And they funded this study along with the NOAA Marine Debris Program, which gave us a grant. Um, but we ended up focusing on weddings, which are the number one happy event during which people release balloons. And we created uh, this website and a bunch of other resources for people who are planning weddings so that they can learn about all the ways they can have a send off to their wedding that does not involve littering the, the atmosphere with helium filled balloons. So check out, this is a website, very robust, lots of good information. It's got information on other ways to celebrate, but it's mostly focusing on, on weddings. Uh, we then created this broader uh, site, preventbloonlitter.org, and I invite you to look at that too. Um, so we, in this website, go more into depth about the impacts of balloon litter and uh, alternatives, in inspirational ideas that you and your family can do that will not create harmful litter. So uh, this was developed also by the Coastal Zone Management Program in Virginia, along with Clean Virginia Waterways and uh, several other partners. But on our website, we've got um, a list of partners and they're from all over the world. We've got partners from Asia and from Africa who also support this, this message. Uh, we also created some short videos. Uh, the videos are one and a half to two and a half minutes. And they're, they're animated, as you can see from these stills. Um, and again, we're just trying to get across to people that there are many ways to celebrate uh, joyfully that will not create um, harmful litter. I want to pause a moment that uh, uh, photo in the upper left, it's a boy, it's a balloon on a power line. Our original research discovered that up to 20% of power outages are caused by mylar. Well, people call them mylar. They're actually uh, foil balloons. Um, when those foil balloons touch a power line, they often cause power outages. And when we spoke to people who, who did release balloons as part of their celebrations, some of them didn't care too much about impacts of balloons on sea turtles. I remember one woman who released balloons at her wedding, um, she justified it by saying, well, there's lots of turtles in the ocean and I only get married once. So sea turtles were not a motivating factor for her. They are for me, but they weren't for her. But when she learned uh, that so many power outages are caused by balloons, that really got to her. So uh, this is why it's important if you're crafting a behavior change effort or campaign that you have to listen to the people who are actually doing the behavior and not just guess, because uh, we never would have guessed that power outages are more important than sea turtles, those of us who are creating this. And these, uh, these videos, by the way, are all on the Clean Virginia Waterways YouTube channel. And um, many of you are probably familiar with campaigns that address um, 
one particular action, like there's a lot of campaigns about straws. The Ocean Conservancy has one and many local um, stores or I'm sorry, restaurants have campaigns. Um, uh, Annapolis has one that says Annapolis doesn't suck. And uh, this kick the straw campaign with the turtle, that's a campaign that Clean Virginia Waterways created for universities and high schools. So the, the great thing about all of these efforts, uh, and many of them are very local, is one of the things that we learn with social marketing that it's best to focus on one behavior, one indivisible behavior to get people to become motivated to change. Uh, for example, rather than say, let's all stop using every piece of plastic related to what we eat and drink. That's a huge ask, that's really big. But here are campaigns that just say, let's just talk about straws. Um, and actually studies show that when you focus on one particular thing, you usually have more success than when you try to be you know, too broad. There's some great books out there about social marketing uh, that I encourage you to look into if you're interested. So um, some other things going on in Virginia, we're uh, trying to create more fishing line recycling centers like you see in this photo. There's uh, some programs that are looking at reducing the use of bottled water in high schools um, through again, social marketing and offering alternatives. Uh, also, if you're not aware, uh, Keep Virginia Beautiful every year has um, grants. I think they're uh, up to 1,000 to 5,000, something like that. Um, they're not very big, but they're enough to motivate uh, a small group of people to try something in their area as far as litter pickups or um, preventing litter in the first place. Um, so there's other, some other resources out there. The Mid-Atlantic, uh, actually Virginia is part of a Mid-Atlantic uh, work group working on all kinds of marine debris issues. And they have a portal where um, information about grant projects is shared. So I encourage you to check that out too. And of course, Keep Virginia Beautiful has a calendar of events if you wanna get engaged. They're asking more groups to use their calendars to get the word out about uh, cleanup events or educational programs. Uh, there's many, many country or county wide collaboratives in some counties. And then uh, of course there are the DEQ litter and recycling grants, which are funded by the Virginia uh, litter tax. And I'm gonna talk about the Virginia litter tax in just a minute. But these uh, litter and recycling grants go to localities, local governments to spend on litter reduction as, as well as recycling. So two of the things that you could get involved with or uh, to learn more. First, there's this website, it's only been around about three years called Litter Free Virginia. And then you see litterfreeva.org. And its main goal is keeping people alert about legislation that's going through the Virginia General Assembly. Um, for in the last couple of years, there's been a lot going on in the General Assembly to reduce litter. So if you want to know uh, what the bills are that you want to support, and they've got um, data, and it's a great website to visit. There's also a new group, it's only um, less than a year old, called the Virginia Plastic Pollution Prevention Network. And this was started by the Virginia Coastal Zone Management Program along with Clean Virginia Waterways and uh, Ecomaniac, which is actually a company in Virginia Beach. Um, and the three of us saw the need for more networking. So this group meets once a month. Our next meeting is next Tuesday, the 15th. Um, it's free to join. And in addition to our monthly meetings where we always have speakers sharing you know, their new research or uh, we've had some scientists speak, we've had um, next week, we've got Oceana talking about their fairly recent report on the impact of plastic pollution on the wildlife of the oceans. Um, but in addition to the monthly webinars, we also have forums on our website where people can again, share, engage, ask questions. So be sure to check that out. 
Um, and one other thing that's, that's uh, I think that we're doing a good job at in Virginia is sharing research. Um, and this is an example of two reports that were written recently by Clean Virginia Waterways, my organization, where we took data that um, otherwise would be in a report of 70 or 80 pages and we distill it down into two or three pages. Uh, just the high points, the key points. Uh, the one on top here talks about Bloom and its impacts and again, distills six years of, of hard research on how big a problem this is. And um, this was distributed to delegates and senators in Virginia prior to their vote last year, uh, the vote which ended up ending the intentional releasing of balloons in Virginia. So um, if you do cleanups uh, with volunteers, I urge you to consider collecting data that can be, that can contribute to these kind of reports. The other report there, um, what I did is I took a look at the data our volunteers have found in Virginia about uh, bottles, uh, plastic bottles, glass bottles, and cans. And I compared data from Virginia with states that have bottle bills. Bottle bills are when you get um, a soda or water or beer, you pay a deposit, usually a nickel or a dime. And then when you return that bottle, you get your deposit back. And what we found in fact, is that Virginia has way more litter from bottles and cans than the states that have bottle bills. Uh, not a surprise, but this is the kind of data that um, decision makers look for when they're trying to make a decision. Another program, uh, you have seen this unless you're a visitor to Virginia Beach and some of the other beaches of Virginia. Uh, Keep It Beach Clean is a program that reaches beach visitors. We try to get them everywhere they sleep, they eat, they, they recreate on the beach, um, in the bars, everywhere. Um, and it's a, basically a, a litter prevention, but we also offer other specific actions they can take. Uh, and this is a, a huge partnership. Lots of restaurants and um, visitors bureaus and nonprofits have contributed to this, as well as the Virginia Aquarium, which is in Virginia Beach. We also offer um, every year a stormwater and litter workshop, which is for stormwater managers mostly because um, the larger communities in Virginia have to write permits for stormwater. And um, part of those permits involve decreasing or eliminating plastic pollution from entering storm drains. It's a big issue. And so uh, we've had these workshops. Our next one will be this fall. Um, so what are other people trying to do? Um, in addition to trying to change behavior through laws and education, there is, of course, removal. Uh, this is a litter trap. It's called a band along, and it floats in a stream. It has to be um, attached, moored, you know, to the sides. But as the creek or stream goes up or down, the band along does as well. And any trash that comes floating down uh, gets uh, directed by these booms to go into the trap. And these band alongs, uh, there's a couple of them in Washington, DC. They don't work on every creek, but um, urban creeks with lots of litter that uh, narrow to the point where you can put in one of these traps. Um, and because plastic floats, that's basically the principle of how this works. But these kind of um, installations, infrastructure are very costly. This band along um, between purchasing it and then doing the survey work and doing all of the, um, you can see that a new pair, a set of steps had to be put in. Uh, this thing cost over $580,000 to be installed. And uh, they estimate it will be $45,000 a year to keep it empty because every time it rains, somebody's got to go down there and remove the debris. So removal works, but expensive. Um, this is another smaller version. This is called a um, uh, sea bin and sea bins are attached to docks and um, piers where there's 
um, not a lot of wave action. So these are usually found at marinas and anybody can lean over, take out the, um, the basket full of debris and dispose of it. Um, so this is another thing that they've got a couple of them in uh, the coastal portion of Virginia. And we're working right now with EPA to see if we can't get more of them um, installed throughout the state. Um, so another important part of our efforts, and by our effort, I mean everyone in Virginia, is to clean up, is to remove this debris. Um, there's many, there's a couple of statewide programs like the Great American Cleanup, which is actually part of Keep America Beautiful, that just happened like, I don't know, two weeks ago. Um, Adopt a Highway is a statewide program that involves people picking up debris. And then the International Coastal Cleanup in Virginia, which is going to uh, start in August and go through November. And that again is the, the uh, project that Clean Virginia Waterways organizes. So if you're interested, uh, please sign up with us, get some friends together and get out there and get some debris and collect data. Uh, there's also lots of regional events, Clean the Bay Day, which also just happened, um, I think last week. Um, and then there's a, a Potomac cleanup, a James River cleanup, Appomattox, all kinds of friends groups do annual or semi-annual cleanups, as well as, of course, local cleanups. And uh, here's a bunch of us on Fisherman Island. Um, we're looking at the ocean and behind us is Chesapeake Bay. Um, I mentioned a little bit about the data our volunteers collect and I want to show you the data card that we use. Um, you can either download the data card, fill it out and scan it or mail it to my office and we'll enter your data. And the data go into an international online database that's open access, which means anyone in the world can download reports to find out what is the biggest problem where you live, or you can compare, you know, how does Virginia compare to California? Um, since we started the International Coastal Cleanup in Virginia, uh, we've had almost actually 120,000 volunteers uh, over 26 years and we've collected almost 5 million pounds. In fact, this year, this fall, I believe one of our volunteers is going to pick up what will represent the 5 millionth pound of debris. Uh, so it's a, it's a big effort and the data um, we put to work on solutions. Another project that is underway, uh, maybe not much an issue where you live, uh, but it's certainly a coastal issue and uh, also with Virginia's freshwater lakes are uh, abandoned boats, abandoned and derelict vessels. So we put together a work group which involves the Navy and the Coast Guard and all kinds of state agencies, local agencies, nonprofits. And uh, we've had 30 some meetings since last January. Um, and actually our recommendations are, are coming out tomorrow on how Virginia needs uh, an abandoned and derelict vessel prevention and removal project uh, uh, with funding to, to deal with this issue. Here's a picture of a boat I took on um, Cedar Island. Uh, it was a commercial boat that was sinking and the Coast Guard came and got the hazardous materials off, oil and gasoline, um, but it's been there for years. And this is an issue, um, lots of impacts on the environment, certainly navigational hazards. You know, you don't wanna be out on a boat at twilight and all of a sudden there's a derelict boat in front of you with no lights. Uh, it can be a real, real hazard. It also impacts the environment um, and economic too. I mean, if you were uh, lucky enough to have coastal property and all of a sudden a storm or through some negligence an old boat end up on your property. Uh, right now, the way the law is, that is your problem to solve. And these can be very expensive to get rid of. Um, it's a coastal issue with commercial as well as recreational vessels. And it's a freshwater uh, issue. Just yesterday, I spoke to a marina owner in Smith Mountain Lake who uh, was talking about a big problem they have with the boat that sunk. Um, and nobody wants to take responsibility for it because it will cost about $30,000 to take care of. Um, some other issues that people are working on, uh, derelict fishing gear like crab pots. Here's a, um, 
you know, crab pots, once they become severed from their floats, they can continue to catch all kinds of things, fish, uh, terrapins, which are endangered. Um, the Virginia Institute of Marine Sciences has done some extensive work on this, as have um, people who go crabbing. They, um, you know, they don't want to lose their, their crab pots either. So a lot of people working on solutions to this. Another issue which is really unique to Virginia um, is clam netting. So we, Virginia, has one of the top aquacultures for clams. So if you eat you know, clam soup or clam chowder, uh, there's a good chance those clams came from the shallow waters of the Chesapeake or the coastal um, Virginia. And the baby clams are protected from predators with this netting, which is a lot like bird netting. It's um, um, plastic. And when these nets become disengaged from where they're supposed to be and they end up on the beaches, they're a big issue. These nets are huge. You can see two of our volunteers in the upper left, they're just like covered in this net that they're trying to remove from this uh, dune. So we're actually working with the aquaculture industry to look at other disposal options and come up with ways to uh, make sure that these get removed from the environment whenever they show up in the environment. That bottom picture, there's a, um, a oyster catcher check that was caught under a net. And luckily the woman who took this photo um, was able to let the bird out after she uh, took the photo. So it's, it's a real issue. Um, we also did some monitoring um, by we, mostly it was the Virginia uh, aqu Aquarium, working with the grant from NOAA and the Marine um, or the uh, Virginia Coastal Zone Management Program. We assisted with the data analysis and uh, every month for four years and four months, every month, volunteers with one trained um, supervisor monitored each of these four sites. And uh, here's a, another pop quiz. Uh, according to that four years of data and monthly surveys, what percentage of debris on the beaches do you think was made out of plastic? So what percent of all the debris was made out of plastic from this study? And the answer is 83% of all the debris was plastic. So that's why we focus on this. Um, here's uh, one of our top researchers here in the red vest, uh, Christina Trapani. She and Kathy O'Hara have done extensive research on a number of barrier islands off the coast of Virginia, trying to look at balloons as litter because data from our volunteers with the International Coastal Cleanup showed that balloons accumulate in the coastal environment. Uh, you might do a cleanup in your county and find one or two or three balloons after several hours. But if you go to these, these islands, balloons are often the number one most frequently found type of debris because balloons travel. They travel through the air, they hit the water, they travel through wind and waves, and they end up disproportionately on the beaches, as well as the attachments. Here's some of the attachments, plastic uh, uh, ribbons, of course. Um, here's a laminated note, a laminated plastic note that was attached to a balloon. Um, and of course, the foil balloons are actually plastic envelopes that are covered with foil paint. Um, so they in themselves are plastic debris. Uh, we went out on um, recently on Fisherman Island and found more than 200 pieces of balloon litter in half a mile. Um, and we keep incredible data on, on each of these pieces and we photograph every single one, just because some people don't believe it's really that bad, but it is that bad. Um, a lot of research is being done on microplastics. A lot of this in Virginia is being done by the Virginia Institute of Marine Sciences. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, they're finding some interesting new um, findings that plastic microplastics in sediment are actually impacting the microbes that live in the sediment of our waterways. There's a lot of laws that uh, we have, excuse me one second. <laughs> a 
we've had a couple of new laws recently. For example, um, the Virginia litter tax, which is paid by businesses who sell beer or soda, for 44 years, stores paid $10 a year. And it recently went up to $20 a year. Um, so instead of raising almost $2 million, it now is almost $4 million. Um, but other states that have litter tax uh, laws in place raise more like $10 million. Um, and since that law was passed 44 years ago, certainly our population has grown and certainly the amount of plastic waste that we produce has increased. So there's actually a group that believe that that tax should go up again, that um, $20 is not a great burden to businesses and that um, it should increase in order to provide more funding to communities to deal with this issue. There's also, as mentioned, uh, a ban on the intentional releasing of balloons that goes into effect in just a few weeks. And then uh, a polystyrene, uh, some people call it styrofoam, but uh, polystyrene food containers will be phased out over the next three years from restaurants in Virginia. Um, the bag fee, and I know um, you're going to be talking about that a little bit more in a minute. Um, there was a, a new law that was passed in 2020 that allows local governments to put a five cent fee on plastic bags. And I wanted to share, you, share with you this data from, um, again, the International Coastal Cleanup data from 2019. The big blue section are all the plastics that we found um, based on our data. And you see that plastic grocery bags were a big part of that issue. Um, and then here's another illustration that shows that the number of plastic bags in Virginia as found as litter has been increasing since we started doing these cleanups in 1995. If you'd like to learn more, uh, we've created this website called Plastic Bag Litter in Virginia. And uh, it, you can find it there um, off of the Clean Virginia Waterways website. And we're trying to provide data for local communities that are considering putting this five cent fee uh, on bags in their community. Um, so I already mentioned the expanded polystyrene food service phase out. Um, there's also a new advisory council it's called the Plastic Waste Prevention Advisory Council. It's made up of some delegates, some senators, um, a, a policy expert, um, and their first meeting is actually next week. And their goal is to come up with recommendations to the General Assembly on things that could reduce plastic pollution. Uh, and this is really exciting. Um, I don't know, this didn't get a lot of press, but in March, our governor, um, announced executive order number 77. And what this is going to do is this summer, this summer that we're in the middle of, um, it's going to phase out disposable plastic bags, single use plastic polystyrene, um, straws, plastic forks, and single use water bottles from state agencies as well as state universities. This is a big shift when you think of the thousands of meals that are served uh, on university campuses. Um, and it's, uh, it's gonna be a big change. And so this is um, leading by example. Uh, and actually that's what the name of this executive order is. It's Virginia leading by example to reduce plastic pollution. Um, many groups have done policies uh, universities have policies against balloon releases, against using glitter. Glitter is basically uh, metallic paint on plastic, tiny pieces of plastic for the most part. So businesses, parks, all kinds of people can contribute through policy changes. Um, just a few pictures about artwork that's being used to educate people. Suffolk Litter Control Office has created a video on how to make these really big cigarette butts. I mean, like really big, two feet long um, as part of an education campaign. So that's an eye opener and fun. Um, this was a very large turtle. It's probably seven feet from uh, tail to head. And it's filled with balloons that were found on barrier islands in Virginia. And this turtle travels around the United, or travels around the, um, the state to people. 
This is a whale, an outline of a whale that's being used in the uh, Shenandoah uh, to educate schools about how much plastic they're using every day. So I wanna close with a few slides on things you can do. You can join the Virginia Plastic Pollution Prevention Network and start coming to our monthly meetings. Um, you can comment on the new Virginia Marine Debris Reduction Plan. And if you are with a group that is working on plastic production or plastic pollution prevention, you can sign up as a partner. And also this is exciting. Um, next month, July 2021 20, 22 is the Mid-Atlantic Marine Debris Summit. It's free to sign up. It's gonna be each afternoon of those three days. And um, there's gonna be some great speakers from businesses, from research, from education, from government. So um, I encourage you to sign up and, and uh, watch that. And we are going to have another Virginia Marine Debris Summit in May of 2022. No details yet on that, but um, I'll be sure to get the word out. So I'm gonna close with this quote and then we'll see if we've got any Q and A. Um, I love this quote, how inappropriate to call this planet Earth when clearly it is ocean. And that's what motivates me every day. And um, I hope it motivates you. So um, at this point, love to hear if you've got any questions. Hi, Katie. Yep, we do have um, a couple of questions. Uh, one that came in was, I think that you actually answered it after, later on in the presentation, but um, uh, so that the content of the Mylar um, uh, balloons, they're, they're, they, they're not recyclable, right? Because it's both foil and plastic, or is that how right. it works? That's right, they're not recyclable. They are um, polypropylene, I think. At any rate, they are plastic, the same as plastic bags, and they're sealed together, and they're covered with metallic paint. And if you see one out in the wild that's been there for a while, you'll see that the metallic paint has all flaked off and it looks almost like a plastic bag for bread or something, but um, yeah, not recyclable and, um, and very dangerous, yeah. Um, but do other folks have questions? This was a fantastic presentation. I wish we could hear our applause. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I'm yeah. obviously passionate about it. Love to talk trash. <laughs> yeah, I, I love to. I love to pick up trash, so that's good. Um, so anybody else have a question, please type it into the um, chat. And I'm hearing informative and clear presentation, Katie. Thanks so much. Great to virtually see you. This is from Robert Jennings, who you might know. And Victoria thank says, it's very informative. And Deborah says, it, thank you so much. Great presentation. And a, bunch, a couple of people have asked me if we we're recording this so we can share all this great information. And I've said yes, but also, I mean, it's really important to look on your website um, to look for all the information because it, it's there, it's accessible there. Yeah, I, that's great. I, I, I appreciate it, people going to our publications page because you'll see our short reports and our long ones. I mean, some of those reports um, go into probably more detail than anybody wants to hear, but yes, please, please go ahead and visit our website. And I have another question well, about whether the slides will be available. Is that, or do you have a presentation on your website anywhere that we could access or? You know, I don't, um, I could share an awful lot of these. Mm -hmm. Some of the images I've used can only be used for educational purposes um, because of copyright. So I would have to take out a few images, but certainly all the data that I shared that came from our volunteers. Yes, I can definitely share all of that. Okay. Um, um, and the question is, why are recycling centers not taking a lot of the plastics that they used to, the three through seven? Ugh. <laughs> that could be a whole hour, but um, basically recycling in this country is completely broken. We depended too much on exporting it, mostly to China. They stopped taking it a few years ago. We have not invested in the infrastructure um, almost nowhere in the United States can three through seven plastics be recycled. Uh, ones and twos can be, there's some people who are pushing manufacturers to only use one and twos in food um, packaging so that 
we can recycle that. Basically, water bottles tend, and soda bottles tend to be ones and twos, which um, are being recycled at some rate. But yeah, the, the lack of infrastructure and um, quite honestly, I think for too long, industry has said, this is not their problem. This is a consumer post-waste problem. And that's how we've become flooded with all this plastic that we don't have the ability to dispose of correctly. So um, I wish I had a quick answer on how we can get to the place where we could be really actively recycling. I know one woman who will not buy anything unless it's in plastics one or two. I mean, she buys glass and metal, but yeah. um, she will not buy plastics three on up because she knows they cannot be recycled in her community. It's a big issue. Yeah, we do. I mean, a couple of people pointed out that um, Whole Foods does take number fives. Um, so, you know, yogurt containers, basically, mostly. So Right, yeah. right. Um, and, you know, they say other than, than expanded polystyrene, which is styrofoam, other plastics can be recycled, but they're not economically viable, unlike ones and twos are economically viable because of the volume and the, um, the guaranteed stream to, you know, if you were running a recycling company, you would probably just want to do ones and twos because you know you're going to get a lot of them. So yeah, chemically they can be recycled, but are they really being recycled? Not to the level we wish they were. And uh, we have, have a question. Will the, the, the Creek Weir collection system would be cheap? Would it be cheaper on smaller streams or do, is it? So. Oh, the in-stream right. the in trap? Mm -hmm. There are other options. I just went to like a seven hour <laughs> webinar on all the different options. And there is a less expensive um, trap trash, but it is at the storm drain, not in the stream. Mm -hmm. And um, I think they were saying that depending, because you have to retrofit your storm drains yeah. uh, and depending on what kind of storm drain you already have, some of these retrofits can be as low as $1,000, um, but you still have the maintenance issue. If you don't yeah. get out there and get the trash and leaves and twigs that accumulate, then you can uh, make flooding worse. So there are less expensive options, yeah. Great. And actually there's a new group, they're on Facebook. I think their name is International Trash Trap or Trash Trap International, something like that. They just started like two months ago yeah. and their goal is to spread uh, information about the different options. Cool. Um, question is, do you know about synthetic turf which disintegrates and sends thousands of pounds of plastic debris and microplastic? into air, soils, and water each year? Yes, that is an issue. The same with uh, tires. I mean, uh, the tires on our car is a huge source and um, playgrounds that use ground up tires in the parks or as mulch. Uh, yeah, these are all sources. Uh, I'm concerned too about weed whackers that have nylon that we're, you know, as that, as the weed whacker works, it's releasing. So yes, there are so many different ways that we are, um, intentionally and uh, unintentionally putting plastic into uh, air, water, soil. Right. Yeah. So we have a question about, is it helpful to document the litter that we pick up for local organizations? And um, how would we go about doing that? And where would we submit that information? Yeah, great. So um, there's an app called Clean Swell. Clean Swell is an app for smartphones. I've got it on my smartphone, you know, right now. Um, and you can sign up. It's through the Ocean Conservancy. It's for as you walk along and you see the litter, you can record it and then hit finish. That's really important. You got to hit finish when you're done collecting your data. And that automatically goes into the Ocean Conservancy's online database. Or you can download from our website um, a paper form that you can fill out and either then scan or take a photo and send it to us, or um, you can put it in an envelope and mail it to us. All that data ends up in the same database. Um, and I think it's really critical. Like um, one county in Virginia just yesterday asked for all of our data for the last five years for their county because they're looking at pushing for a bag uh, fee. And I keep saying bag fee, not bag tax. 
um, there's a difference between a tax and a fee. Um, so the data are, are going to work. So yes, whenever you do a cleanup, I find the best way to collect data um, cause some volunteers don't like to collect the data. They just want to get out there and get the trash, which is great. Mm -hmm. Um, so we usually have one data collector who just walks and, and fills out the data card or fills out the online app while everyone else picks up the, the, the debris. Um, at the end of the day, the debris gets picked up at the end of the day, we've got data. Um, yes. Yeah, so if anyone's interested in learning more, I'd be happy to talk to you about that. Great. Um, I just got a comment that the Department of Taxation is currently drafting guidance for locality seeking to implement the bag tax fee. So that, that'll be helpful yes. as we're going forward. Probably already need it. And they only did that because Roanoke passed the law a few yeah. like two weeks ago. Yeah. Um, and that forced the tax department to actually write guidelines. Yay. Yay, Roanoke. <laughs> Yay, no. I'm so I'm, I can't believe they got there before we did. <laughs> um, uh, one per person pointed out that the General Assembly passed a program of high T paralysis that yields some reusable stuff. Is that? Um, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the first part of your question. The General Assembly passed a program of high T paralysis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right, right. So um, there's a process by which plastics, they're not burned, they're heated. They're heated at a very, very high temperature so that they become um, molecules that can then be used as, as fuel or molecules that can be used in the production of plastics again. And the, the law that was passed, as I understand it, removes any of these facilities in Virginia from following the same laws as solid waste management. Um, and it removes them from oversight from the state level or local level governments. Um, and so most environmental groups were not in favor of that bill because they thought, hey, if all this waste is coming into these facilities, they need to have some oversight, you know, um, just like a landfill uh, would have oversight. Um, and I, I need to learn more about this whole process, but one of my big questions is I want to see the energy budget uh, creating high levels of heat high enough to melt plastic has got to be high energy. And I just want to see proof that the constituents that come out of the melted plastic or the heated plastic um, are economically worth more than the energy that's put into it. Um, maybe that's true, but nobody has answered that question. And I've been asking that. So there's my two cents. <laughs> no, I, I know there's a lot of skepticism about that whole process. So um, I have a question about what um, are, what are Virginia colleges and universities doing now to discourage organized balloon releases? Ah. Actually, I, I see I'm in the dark. I'm going to turn on my light yeah. here. <laughs> I was going to mention that. There we go. The sun went down. <laughs> um, yeah, actually, a number of schools have, uh, like Virginia or Longwood University, uh, that's the campus that I'm on. Mm -hmm. uh, we passed a policy several years ago against 